moment. I thought we would just uh, take this minute or two of handshaking to establish the connection, uh, get your presentation up on screen, and I'll explain to the, uh, to the workshop attendees the way that this will work, is that uh, thanks again to the generosity of our sponsors, we gather that we have uh, very good worldwide connections. Our colleagues on the East Coast have been following the last session uh, minutely and in great detail. Uh, Herbert's now going to give a presentation over this, uh, over this connection. Uh, he will show his uh, presentation on the screen behind. Uh, he's operating it remotely, so he has complete control. Um, and uh, we are establishing communication through this wireless microphone that I'm using at the moment. So at the end of the presentation, uh, Herbert is open to questions from the floor. Uh, so the, the Q&A session will begin just as before, um, but we will pass this microphone to, uh, to individuals if you want to make your, uh, if you want to make your query. Um, and you're asked to speak particularly clearly because this is a slightly less clear uh, audio connection, but seems to be working tolerably well. So I think uh, if everyone is, is ready. Okay. So welcome back to this session, everyone. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Herbert Bernstein, um, who has done a great deal of practical work on establishing uh, the, uh, initially the image SIF format for, for images and has been very closely associated with the, uh, with the Nexus Committee over the last year or two in maintaining compatibility of semantics between image SIF and Nexus. And as we uh, heard to some extent in the previous presentation, it's extremely important that there are agreed standards, not merely of format, but of content. So over to you, Herbert. Thank you very much. Thank you all for putting up with me participating remotely. Uh, it, it, it is very, very helpful to me personally. I appreciate it. Thank you. What I'd like to talk to you about is dealing with common diffraction image metadata as a specification in ImageSIF, HDF5, and Nexus. That it's going to be something common. That we're not going to worry so much about the particular format. We're going to worry about the information. It, it, things are working, why change them? Uh, Vladek Miner is absolutely right. We're doing wonderful science right now with what we've got. The last thing the world needs is to do something new and different. But there is something new and different coming, and, and that is going with the newer, faster, brighter light sources is a new generation of fast pixel array detectors. For example, the Dector Siger, uh, the, the, the Cornell Slack uh, uh, pixel array detector, the CS pad for the XFELs. So since things, despite the fact that we would like to cling to the past, are changing, we need to revisit and extend the approaches we've used in the past, both to represent the data and the metadata. They both need to change. The data has to be compressed. I know it's much more convenient to deal with uncompressed data. We could, in some cases, deal with just uncompressed data, but if we stick to uncompressed data for everything, more and more of the research budgets will be eaten just to store and move the data. It really is getting out of hand. We really are a big data problem. We need to do something different. And the metadata needs a common ontology for multiple formats. There are more than 200 formats. At some point, you're going to do an experiment that tries to deal with data from more than one of them. If you don't have some way of understanding the relationship and meanings between multiple formats, you're going to make a mistake in combining that data. CBF, the, the crystallographic uh, image format, binary format, uh, which is, uh, uh, has a dictionary image SIF, the image uh, representing crystallographic information framework, uh, is one way of gathering all the essential definitions. And don't make the mistake of thinking 
that only one definition is possible for one concept. If you need to deal with polarization three different ways, as I do, then you will simply have three sets of tags and you'll specify the relationship among them. SIF is changing. SIF used to have to stick to the strict rule of everything is defined once and the winner takes all definitions. A new thing is coming. It's called DDLM and DREL, which will allow the relationships among data tags to be algorithmically specified, and we can have more than one. We've had them for the longest time in crystallography. We've had thermal parameters two different ways. We can make that you know, very, very general. We can keep what you understand as your way of doing things, what I understand as my way of doing things, what Andreas understands as his way of doing things, and we can work out the necessary mappings, and the important point is that we'd be willing to write down the mappings, not that we you know, defend our various religious positions, this is the only right way to do it, that we accept that we're a polylingual world and that we work out the clean mappings among our more than 200 different formats. So let's just talk about two of them, CBF and what you're going to get with the IGER, which is Nexus HDF5. It's very, very important that we do this in a way that what we produce is going to end up compatible with the standards of archives such as the PDB or, 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 or CSD. And that means that if we got all this IGER data sitting there in Nexus format, at some point, we need to be able to see that same data in SIF format. The data, the metadata, all of it, we need to be able to see it that way. That doesn't mean every time we touch it, it needs to be a SIF. And we need to make sure it's going to be compatible with the data processing software. Now, there is that nasty business of compression. John asked me to be sure to tell you you know, uh, 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 where things stand on compression, so I'm going to take a little time to do that. <sighs> there is no one answer on, on compression. It depends on the experiment as to what compression is appropriate. For some of them, none is appropriate. For some of them, none is the only choice. But for many of them, the science allows for some reasonable choices of compression. Some data compresses easily. Medium source brightness, ultra-fine sliced macromolecular data compresses beautifully. If you, if, if, if you look at the initial experiments with the LZ4 squared compression, there were quite accurate representations of 60 to 1 compressions. That if you have data that's mainly zeros with a few peaks in it, that compresses very easily. But some data is very difficult to compress. If you have high source brightness macroelectric data and you're in air and you have ice rings, the compression is a disaster. That's very, very hard to compress data. If you have tomographic, pictographic data, those are also very hard to compress. So the data formats have to allow for multiple alternate compressions. And James Holton is right. Lossy compression, as he has proposed, may be needed for some data. Now, as I said, LZ4 squared works very well for very sparse data, 60 to 1 compressions. When we move to that moderately dense MX data, it's 5 to 1. When we go to high source brightness, dense MX in air, in air with ice rings, it gets as bad as 2.5 to 1. The byte offset that, you know, Vladek was pointing out that a lot of the data is being handled byte offset. Well, in this case, it's not a bad idea because that'll give you four to one compression. And another compression that's available in, in, in the library gives you seven to one compression. However, as I said, Holton's right. We're working on a wavelet compression alternative to be able to move smoothly from lossless to lossy compression. And don't get out the pitchforks and the torches and come after me because I said the word lossy. You really do throw away some of your data when you do any experiment. You just call it data reduction. Okay? 
you, you, you know, some, some of it goes away. You need to very calmly, dispassionately consider the question of lossy compression. And I'll give you an incentive to, 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 to consider it. Okay? Here is 1 27th of an ADSC quantum 315 image. The background happens to be rather clean. The entropy limit on compressing this, the best you can do keeping every single pixel is 8.2 to 1. But notice those yellow numbers on the side there. The top frame is one-to-one -one compression. That's the faith, that's exactly a faithful image. Below it, you have an 80-to-one wavelet compression using a package called Epsilon. And below that, 100-to-one. The spots are preserved. It's the background that is getting slightly messed up. So for the purposes of MX, not diffuse scattering, please. For the purposes of, of you know, or, you know, ordinary MX, we can actually tolerate some rather extensive use of lossy compressions. That's what I promised John I would include in, in, in this talk. I've met my obligation. Right. Now, back to the metadata issue, since this is a metadata workshop. Not all the metadata you need to successfully work with, with your data is available from a single source. As Andreas was pointing out, some of the metadata is known to the detector. Some of the metadata is known to the beamline. Some of the metadata is known to the user. Some data or metadata is not known until later. Fortunately, a couple of decades ago, Kim Hendrick proposed a solution. It's called a harvest. You basically do things and you harvest from them useful additional data and metadata. And this is a very, very sensible approach. And I am proposing we now adopt it for these new fast detectors as a way of, of dealing with this problem in an organized way. You have your primary data. You have your merged detector metadata and data in HDF format ready for preliminary spot finding. You then can augment that okay, with additional data, say, on the axis configurations. Okay. We'll have a template, a CBF template or an HDF5 template. They're actually the same thing. Then you can get, as you, as you work on this, ultimately process data by merging the primary data, the beamline data, the user data, and your processing results, including perhaps a structure solution. HDF5 is the perfect container for this. It differs from a SIF. With a SIF sitting there with a completed file, we have some new data to merge, we need to write a new file. With an HDF5 data set, it's just like a file system. We can add stuff into it without having to do massive rewrites to the entire thing. So you are sitting there with 52 gigabytes of data. The 52 gigabytes of data can sit there. You have a couple of hundred megabytes of metadata, you just add to that couple hundred megabytes of metadata. Now, the reality is that metadata in different formats and with different names, that's often necessary. We need interoperable, consistent definitions and mappings. And we've started to do that. For example, axes. Nexus had a an approach to representing the positions of components in a beamline with a thing called NX geometry. And that really wasn't flexible enough for what we need to do with the Iger at a beamline. More needed to be done. So what did we do? We picked up the SIF approach to finding axes and defined a new thing in Nexus called NX transformations which is part of NXMX and Nexus, where you can put in your axis definitions very much the same way they've been put in in CBF templates. Okay. So the result in, in, in HDF5 comes out where you find something such as you know, the omega axis, and we'll take a very limited case, say we're at 23 degrees, 23.5 degrees, and 24 degrees, okay? 
And we ha will have attributes, depends on equipment, transformation type, units, a vector, there's also an offset, there's more. And we're in the middle of a discussion. So far we have stuff that's agreed to on specifying you know, where, where things are going to. And then we have things where we're specifying you know, additional suggestions. You can add to metadata. Just don't take the same name in the same metadata definitions and try and use it with two different meanings. Now, CBF is staying CBF. Nexus is going to remain Nexus. You can use either one when needed, and we're really starting to see that with the Iger. There are HDF5 data streams which are being then handled as CBF data streams, and things are getting combined back into Nexus data streams. You move back and forth as you need to. We're doing new dictionaries and extensions to existing dictionaries to help in document the mappings. And applications gain from the extensions to the APIs, and the place we're starting right now, since that happens to be what I maintain, is CBF Live, but I really encourage other people to get into the game. Basically, just trying to work with making things interoperable. Okay? You gain things from that. As I mentioned earlier, we need more compressions. Well, HDF5 and Nexus are gaining the CBF Live compressions, and CBF is gaining the HDF5 compressions. Things add. We no longer need to compete. We can complement and help one another. Okay? The, 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 the templates for, for merging into the stream for this harvesting could be Nexus HDF5 templates. They could be CBF image sift templates. They can be converted one to the other. Well, there has to already be a large pool of CBF templates for beamlines. HDF5, it's rewrite and replace, CBF does not. So, CBF to Nexus, CBF Live, you can convert a CBF template to an HDF5 template. And then you can cheerfully simply rewrite and place an HDF5 instead of to write a whole new 52 gigabytes of data. So an example of a portion of Iger 1M CBF template defining axes is, is, is right below. It looks like the same stuff that Lowe showed you. That is just, the, it is the same stuff. You simply make a clear description of what's on a particular beam line. The axes are this way. And don't think this is something that you do just once. As Vladek pointed out, metadata needs to be maintained. So you need to very carefully check, are these templates right? But once you have made sure the templates are right, the rest can thoroughly automate it. Automation is not a bad thing if you steer it properly, if you guide it properly. Okay. That template becomes a well, physically much larger template in HDF5, uh, at, but basically it's the same information that's coming out. C CBF image SIF, which is yeah, sort, of, sort of your documentation tool for this scheme, there are multiple types. There are DDL1 SIFs, there are DDL2 SIFs, there are DDLM SIFs coming. DDLM will carry all of the above on its uh, nice broad back. SIF okay? dictionaries define terms can be used in the relationships, and what I am doing on the DDL2 MM SIF compatible image SIF dictionary is to add the next documentation into it. You can add terms of your own. As I said, please do it in a non conflicting way. There are two organizations you need to be aware of, make sure you know. The committee that takes care of SIF is the Committee on the Maintenance of the SIF Standard. The committee that takes care of Nexus is the Nexus International Advisory Committee. And in one of those rare moves of harmony and science, we're working together. So you can talk to either one about what you need and the information will get communicated to the other. Okay? SIFs are organized into blocks. It's very database friendly. Okay? We skip the rest of these details because time is short. 
HDF5 and Nexus, nice self-describing. And as Lowe's mentioned, Nexus is a tree-oriented view. Now, it may seem that going back and forth between a table-oriented view and a tree-oriented view of the same information is hard. And the answer is yes, it is hard. But it is also necessary. You cannot maintain a database table-oriented reliably. Sorry, yeah, sorry tree-oriented reliably. You have to maintain a database table-oriented. So if you are planning at any point to take all your data and metadata and get it into a database, then you should really like SIF. On the other hand, in terms of performance, when dealing with massive amounts of data, trees are wonderful. They introduce log factors in, in terms of timing. And trees are exactly the right thing you want when dealing with this incredible flood of data. So we have to be willing to move back and forth between the tree view and the table view of data. For more information on this, I know it is a somewhat you know, complex set of, of, of ideas being put together. Well, the IUCR maintains their information on the IUCR website. Nexus has the nexusformat.org website. I gave you a couple of publications, and Brian's going to yeah, make these slides available after the meeting. And I should acknowledge DECTRIS, which has funded this work, uh, uh, NIH and IGMS, which has funded some of it, the OE Office of Science, which has been very helpful, uh, IUCR Committee on the Maintenance of the SIF Standard, Nexus International Advisory Committee, uh, the BNL Life Science Biomedical Technology Research, LISBR. Uh, if, you're, if you think of, of as, as uh, was mentioned by Vladek, uh, NSLS2 was shut, sorry, NSLS was shut down. We now have NSLS2. So the things you were thinking of as PXRR under NSLS are now going to be LSBR under NSLS2. And a few people I need to thank, uh, Caden Bedalian, who worked with me on the compression, Mike Francis, who makes my things comprehensible, uh, Aaron Brewster on CSPAS stuff, uh, John Jacknick uh, on uh, some of the data for compression uh, for the other. Uh, we're doing Iger simulations using MILFSOM. Not pronounced MOTSOM backwards by, by uh, uh, James Holton, uh, Bob Sweet, Graham Winter, and Tobias Richter. And thank you very much for your attention. Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah, yes, two very important questions, all right? One is whether the compression needs to be sensitive to what you are doing with the data, and I agree completely, absolutely. What is correct for something which is a classical MX experiment with just drag peaks is dead wrong for diffuse scattering. That, that is not what you would want to do. 
you need to select the correct compression for what, you know, what it is that you want to do. Fortunately, we can get compressions in the range of 4 to 1 to about 8 to 1 and not lose a single pixel, not, you know, not lose any intensity at all. I'm only talking about the cases where the science permits dealing with a lossy compression to do that. But now to your second question in terms of the number of images on the, on, on, on the fine slicing. Part of the fine slicing argument has to do with the instrumentation. That when doing the high count rate correction, it is desirable to have fewer counts in the pixels when doing the high count rate collection. After that has been done, it would be feasible then to sum groups of images. If you look in, in, in the, you know, again, the MX experiment looking at the mosaicity, we were just looking at a data set yesterday that was done as, you know, 0.1 degrees. And the mosaicity would have argued for something closer to 0.3 degrees, but keeping the count rate correction as, as accurate as possible argues for the 0.1. Well, one could collect the data as the point one and do something which amounts to a slightly lossy compression, some in groups of three images. And for both the diffuse scattering and the, you know, the Bragg peak you know, uh, 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 type experiment, that would not cause any negative effect on the results. That, 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 th that three to one compression, which in fact is, quote, losing some data, loses no scientific information. So you, you basically, yeah, as, as, as Vladek will tell you, engage your brain. You need to look at what your data is to decide what you're doing. You can't have a pure automaton decide, oh, well, this can now be squished down 100 to 1 and then lose the essential data. But if you have your automaton say, oh, we can get another factor of 3 to 1, provided the following you know, conditions are met and we happen to meet those conditions, that strikes me as a good thing. Did I answer your question? I think it should be a three-way collaboration among all the stakeholders. We need to start getting to consensus agreements. I don't think any side can mandate. We've been through several rounds of one entity or another involved in, in, in the scientific process mandating this is the solution. I think we need to do exactly what we're doing here in this workshop. Talk to one another. Come to consensus agreements. Agree completely.
<laughs> True. Absolutely. You're you're absolutely you're absolutely right. I'm in complete agreement, and we are in fact working on it. If you have data that's appropriate to that, you're completely right. But you know, you, you, you're not necessarily going to get away with that with a tomographic image, a pictographic image, and a lot of diffuse scattering images. So thank you very much for that, Herbert. Thank you for your, uh, your contribution to the workshop, which has sparked, uh, as all the contributions today, a lot of, uh, a lot of interesting consequences. Um, so technically, we have to tear down the Skype connection so we can revert to, uh, to live presentations. But I hope you'll continue to follow us. And Absolutely. I hope you have an opportunity to follow in the second day as well tomorrow. I certainly will. Thank you very much. Thank you. Much obliged. Bye-bye. <laughs>